All right, well, let's get rolling on beefcake number 16. All right. I think that you need to walk out and walk back in because I'm going to provide you with theme music. Okay, hold on a second. Now you can enter. Throw your hands in the air. Oh, the crowd's going crazy. This is going to be big. I'm going to have, like, you're going to be, like, a wrestling entrance. I do have a couple of fans. Yeah, you do. Someone liked has liked a tweet of mine at once. Does that make you feel good? Yeah. I live for that. The likes and the retweets. So what's really funny is, like, when a famous person likes a tweet or something like that or an Instagram post. Uh-huh. That, that, I really like that. Yeah, Mark Gasol and Jake the Snake have both liked my tweets nice i've had a couple of likes from uh kevin smith that's pretty big which is kind of neat do you think that's kevin smith or a guy representing kevin smith uh in his case i believe it's actually him yeah you're probably right well this has been forever since we've done that since we've gotten together and done this podcast we were on vacation i was in disney world and you were went to the beach went to the beach and disney world both in back-to-back weeks right i I went one week yeah two weeks Man, I bet people out there have just, I don't even know how they've gotten by without us. I mean, they're sweating. They're just anxious. I I missed all of this. I missed the writing. For the week that I was gone, I just posted old blog posts, you know, that a lot of people probably haven't read, and some people have, and were kind enough to not point that out. Oh, you just reposted? There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I didn't think that there was. And then I thought, if somebody does notice and calls me out on it, then that's flattering in and of itself. Right. That means that that person was watching. That's right. And so I I wrote a blog when I got back from the vacation because I had an experience, as I always do, as I try to have every day, and it was one that I felt was writable. I called it, No One Can Make You Feel Anything. The story behind this is we had been at the beach. You know how much work goes into that. There was nine of us. There was me and my mom and Amanda, my wife. Oh, wow. Our two kids, my brother, his wife, and his two kids, mine are 10 and 7. My brother's kids, my nephews are 5 and 3, which is a lot of work. Wow. Yeah, I saw a couple of the pictures while you were gone. I was like, who are all these kids? Yeah, we were all crammed. I say crammed in there. My, My mom had rented us this really great place, and we had a really great time, but you know how exhausting it can be. And so we were going and going and going, and then at night we decided to go play mini golf. And my son had made it clear, my 10-year-old, that he really wasn't that interested in going to play, but I asked him to come along. He came, and he was getting frustrated because golf is frustrating. Right. And with each stroke, he was getting more and more frustrated, and he was not taking his time, and the putts were just going everywhere. It was painful to watch. I know that feeling. It was really, really painful to watch because he doesn't play golf. I mean, he has no reason to be good at at golf. But as the frustration continued to build, he got to about hole 11 and just came unglued. He broke down crying. He was trying to hold it back. He couldn't hold it back anymore. And I wanted to be sympathetic. You know, I asked him how he was feeling, what was bothering him. He couldn't answer my questions. And then I felt my frustration beginning to build. Finally, I said, toughen up. Knock it off. Quit pouting. You're ruining it for everybody. Yo, man up. Man up. That's what I gave to him. And I gave him a little bit of time and then went back to him and basically repeated those same sentiments. And Amanda, who always does a better job, was relating to him and saying that, you know, she's been there before. She knows what that feels like. She's telling him different stories about times that she's broken down crying when she gets frustrated. I, on the other hand, am over there pissed off. Mm -hmm. You know, they say if you spot it, you got it. So if something's bothering you about somebody else, generally there's something about you that's bothering you. Yes. And I've always been a powder. I've always, when I don't get my way, I, I pout. If I don't play well or do well, I pout. I can remember my dad standing at the gate at the fences of baseball games when I got moved from pitcher to first base because people were roping me all over the place, pulling my hat down and crying, and him just looking at me and saying, stop pouting. 
Of course, my response is always, I'm not pouting. I think I'm a powder too. I think I'm learning to not be so much of a powder. I don't. I mean, I don't remember like breaking down and crying when I was a kid, but I do know that I pout like if things don't go the way I want them to go. And is that today as an adult you pout? Yeah. Do you pout more or less than when you were a kid? Uh, I I think I want to say that I I've pouted more as an adult than I did as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might be getting worse, not better. <laughs> or it's becoming more pronounced. I can. I know when I'm doing it. Yeah. But that doesn't stop. Or you're just, you're just becoming more aware of yourself. Yeah. I think that's it. Ooh. Now you have, you have kids. Are you compassionate when your kids pout or are you more on the frustrated side of things? Uh, I don't get frustrated. I want to say that I'm, I'm more, uh, I don't think compassionate is the right word. I think I'm just like a pushover. Just hands off. Do you leave them alone? E, E, I don't think so. I think it's different for the girls and the boys. Like the, I think I'm more with, with my son. I'm more of what's wrong with you straighten up before I knock you upside the head. And then with the girls, it's like, Oh, I'm sorry. You do whatever you want. I'm guilty of that. I even Grayson called me out on it at one point in time. And that, that hurt when he said, why you don't do that to Andy. I was apologizing <laughs> to him because I got on to him as I, as I always do. I, sometimes I feel like I'm just always, always, always on them. Do this. Why'd you do that? What are you doing? Look at this. And, you know, it just, it eats me up. Yeah, I think that's what my wife does. That My wife is the one that's like making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. And if they don't, she's the punisher. And I'm like the, the softy. Yeah, but Holly's more rational than I am. Oh, yeah, and there's no question about that. Like, you know, she's, she's making sure people are doing what they're supposed to do because they're supposed to do them. Exactly. I'm just sort of an emotional guy, and so when I'm when I'm con- trying to concentrate and kids are being loud, then I just get all over them just because I'm not getting my way. Yeah. Are I you a – um, are you codependent? Are you familiar with – do you know what codependent means? No. If people around you are upset, does that upset you? If Holly's sad, do you feel sad for her? Do you want to fix that? Yeah, yeah. De- I'm definitely, uh, I, I almost said I was a fixer, but I don't think I'm a fixer. I think it just bothers me. It, it depends on what the person's upset about. If they're upset about something that I've done, then that drives me crazy. If they're upset about something that I've done or something they think I've done, that bothers me in a big way. Uh, but if they're upset about something that I don't really know about or don't understand, I don't get upset. So just having someone around you upset is not upsetting to you as long as you not necessarily do with it. Right. I'm, I'm a, I guess I would be classified as a fixer, but I'm more a fowler upper. I I dig the holes deeper by trying to fix them than if I would just leave them alone. Oh yeah. I definitely do that. I, I do that a lot too. Like where, where I try, where it bothers me so much to where I, the, the things I choose to do after, after it starts bothering me, like just make it worse and worse and worse. Yeah. It's like a, a little fat kid when he starts to fall over and he trips and he keeps trying to gather his composure and he trips a little bit more and trips a little bit more. And then he ultimately just falls right on his face. Yeah. That's how every problem that I attempt to solve goes. But I grew up with a dad that is a, my, my dad's a fixer and he, he never went to bed. We never went to bed angry at each other. There was no situation that he didn't at least call and try to bring some closure to uh, throughout my life. And so I try to do that with, with my kids. I think that I have uh, a bit of codependence, probably a lot of codependence. If somebody is upset at anything, it doesn't have to be me. If I feel like somebody's angry then I become nervous. If I feel like somebody is sad, then I'm sad for them, and I want to do what I can to make that better. Do you think there that you can consciously let that go? Like if you if you find yourself uh, anxious or you know angry about something like that, do you think it's possible just to say, "Okay, stop for a second. I'm letting this go. It doesn't bother me anymore." Yeah, for sure. But it's something that has to be practiced because I don't realize that I'm, I'm doing it unless I stop for a little while. 
Yeah, there's a really good podcast with uh, Tony Robbins and Tim Ferriss that I was listening to today on the way here. And he talks about a 90-second rule that he and his wife have. He basically is, this has decided that he's going to spend his day having an awesome experience, kind of like what you said um, earlier about your vacation where you wanted to have a good experience. And if anything comes up that, that is negative or stressful, they have this 90-second rule where they just stop think about it for 90 seconds and then let it go. And they're back to having a good experience again. I want to live with Tony Robbins. Yeah. I can just listen to him talk forever, man. He's incredible. He really is. And he cusses. Do we have a, um, did we have an episode where we talked about, uh, people cursing? No, and how we probably was, need to. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like we did, but whatever. Like I noticed, like if you see him on Oprah, he's like the perfect guest. He never says anything. It never says a cuss word, of course, on TV or anything like that. But if you get his movie, he likes to say, he likes to, to drop F-bombs and things like that. A lot. But he, yeah. he gets away with it. He does it He's good because he's good at it. And that's, Yeah, we did talk yeah. about this. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It's like an art form where if you're good at it, you can get away with it. But if you're, if you're, just, if you're just randomly saying cuss words to be saying cuss words, it doesn't really work. You made it clear that I wasn't the best curse worder in the world. Yeah, that was on one of our podcasts. That was when we were playing golf. Ah, that's I bet that's true. That's where it was. Do you ever catch yourself saying, he made me feel like, she made me feel like, she made me sound like, he made me look like? I don't know. know. Th those kind of words, like, you make me feel like I'm so dumb, or you make me feel like that I can't do anything. Yeah, sure, I guess I'd probably do that. I was told... It was when I was in rehab and therapy, and I had a pretty tough-nosed therapist guy, and he made it clear that no one can make you feel anything. Putting that off is just a way of avoiding responsibility. And that's what I was doing with my son, Grayson. In the blog, I talk about how Grayson got over his emotional outburst and came to me, and he apologized. And I, of course, accepted the apology, but I was still pouting. I still had my chest out. I still wanted him to feel, I wanted him to see, you know, what he had done. Mm -hmm. And so then I got home that night and I thought, who's acting more childish? You know, I'm 40 <laughs> years old. He's right. a child acting childish because he's a child. Right. I'm a 40 year old man who's pouting around because I'm being a turd. <laughs> I wanted to believe Grayson made me feel that way. Grayson ruined my time. Grayson did this and that, but ultimately it didn't have anything to do with Grayson. It was your choice to let it that happen. It was my choice. Yeah. He might be to blame, but my reaction to it is ultimately my responsibility. And I was reading a book just this weekend that talks about that, that you can find a lot of different things to blame on a lot of people and that's fine, but it doesn't make them responsible. And the point that this guy used was poker players. You know, you can be dealt an extremely bad hand in poker and still win. Some right. people are just better at playing cards. And some people know how to turn a bad hand good, and some people can't do anything with a good hand. Right. And that's the way that I was kind of growing up, I guess, is that I had a really good hand dealt to me, but I didn't know how to play it. And so I made it appear to be bad. Huh. What book was that? It is The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. I haven't read it, but I saw By it. By Mark Manson, I believe, is is his name. Yeah, I think that's right. I really like him, and his book's really good. Cool. So I suggest that you check it out. What else you got? What else do I have? So I'll tell you what we got. What do we got? We got a three-month deadlift program. We do have a three-month deadlift, deadlift program, and uh, I'm really excited about it. Go to liftheavyrunlong.com slash deadlift. You can blame whoever you want for being weak. You can blame it on your genetics or you can blame it on your mom or you can blame it on your work. But ultimately, it's your responsibility to deadlift and get strong. That's right. Segway. And that is why you need to go get this program. And Twitter. Man, I'm, I am all about the Twitter. I'm yeah, all over you've been, Twitter. You've been Twittering it up. <laughs> I love like, it. A lot. And Instagram and our Facebook page and our Facebook group. All of these things you need to be. You've been tweeting like things I don't even understand. 
I've been tweeting things I don't understand. <laughs> like who who is he talking about? <laughs> Give me an example. Uh, I can't. Uh, let's see. It was, it was something about football, probably. If I'm it like, was, oh, I, I, I said that the world needs Brian Bosworth. Well, I know who Brian Bosworth is. I understood that. We need the boss. Some, I don't know. Something about like, I got a follow from so-and-so and he's running Mississippi State or something like that. Oh, yeah. That was Hayden Campbell, a friend of ours from the gym. Oh, okay, cool. He's down there at Mississippi <laughs> State doing it big. Reddit. Still Reddit. on Reddit. We're still there. What is that? Reddit.com slash r slash lift, lift heavy, heavy run, run long. long. That's correct. And our Twitter and Instagram is at lift run long. Follow us there. And we still have music. Music by Ted Horrell and the Monday Night Card. That's right. Was gifted to us. And that's what you're listening to right now. And that's what you're going to hear on the way out. So if you get the chance, go to iTunes. Sweet. And look for Ted Horrell, H-O-R-R-E-L-L, and the Monday Night Card. Sweet. Peace. She's not good for you. No need to tell you. Because you know. Not bad, she's just bad for you. My advice for you is that you should go. She's got you hanging round, like some locket she found. You got to put her, you got to put her down. She's got, she's got ten to you. Forgotten who you used to show. She's not right. She's not right for you. Not even close to what you let go. She's got you hanging round like some locket she found. You got to put her. You got to put her down.